point out that that was the issue I was trying to get at with liability. If you buy a piece of software and it's fraught with bugs, then you should be able to hold the vendor uh, liable. Thank you, Addison. Don't buy it in the first place. Okay, this is the last question from the floor, then we'll go back to the panel, please. Jim Isaac, this one's working. Jim Isaac from the Computer Society. Uh, I would have to point out one of the challenges we have is getting industry to actually hire people who are qualified software engineers to do the work on the software they do. That's a well-defined concept. There are standards, there's curriculum, there's uh, criteria, there's even licensing being developed in the United States. But until industry actually requires it, uh, it's not going to be a value and people aren't going to be doing it. Thanks for going on, sir. I, I concur, and the only way, because it's an economic e equation, I mean, having been in the software business for a long time, I can tell you that the, pres the pressure to get a product out on time uh, sometimes overrides the, uh, the desire to build it right, or the urge to build it right. And this is a, a cost and a benefit that, that has to be somehow commercially uh, balanced, and the way to do this is to, is to, um, is to increase the uh, the cost of producing bad software. And the only way that I know how to do that is to hold the manufacturers liable. Thanks, Addison. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a few minutes left, and I'd like to use that time to invite our panelists to come back with some final comment. But in doing so, I'd like us to reflect a little on the international dimension of our summit here. I think what I've heard in this panel, but elsewhere as well, is that uh, we've got a lot of catch-up to do in uh, domestic uh, regimes, if I can use that word, uh, whether that's a formal legal regime of compulsion or one of uh, voluntary association, uh, you know, I think we can choose. But uh, as the technology advances, uh, I, you know, we hear of um, a variety of problems that remain unaddressed. I think it's a conviction of the East-West Institute that uh, if that's the situation in a developed country with great wealth, what's the situation uh, in other parts of the world? And there's clearly um, some huge political uh, divides around of the sort that uh, Hennig referred to uh, in his uh, discussion of political repression. And I think Stain, um, as the chair of an international group of experts convened by the main United Nations body responsible for international te telecommunications, I think um, can really represent here the dilemmas, the divisions that exist internationally. So I really invite the panelists in their closing remarks, but all members of the summit as we go through our final work tomorrow, to understand how we translate our experience uh, at the domestic level to some of these unaddressed problems at the international level and really how individually uh, we might um, uh, volunteer our own expertise or, or sense of direction to uh, what we're all trying to achieve here. But if we could uh, perhaps start in the same order that we uh, began with before. Stan, you go first uh, Chris, for the final comment. Yeah, let's uh, talk a little first on who stole my data, as was one of the questions. I would respond to that, go to the police, make a police report. I like to say that I was born by the FBI and raised by the Department of Justice in the 1970s into computer crime. And I can still assure you that you have one of the most, if not the best law enforcement agency in the world. So FBI would be a very nice police agency or law enforcement agency to report the case to, and they will find out. And so too, I will also give Havan some comments on his, uh, on his first question. He, he raised the question of cybersecurity and the terminology and what it stands for. In, in my work, I have always seen cybercrime as a part of the total cybersecurity picture. So the cybersecurity is the overall terminology and cybercrime Cybercrime is only a part of it. You, you notice, we'll notice in my paper that is presented to you um, that I'm talking about these aspects. And also, of course, every country has to be respected for their views. We know for sure that Russia will never sign the convention, European Convention on Cybercrime. Then 
President Putin declared that. And those of us who have been in Turkey will know that Turkey will never sign the Convention on Cybercrime. And of course, these countries must be respected for their views. And to the Minister of Estonia, which this morning raised a question, was asked about what about the International Criminal Court. I also agree that we should be a little cautious on that aspect. But um, today, but maybe tomorrow, when we have discussed and finished a um, discussion for some years, I'm not afraid of these years, we have to think of the future of our children and grandchildren and cannot discuss one, two, three years more to come. We have to start on it today and take actions. And the, today's interpretation of the criminal, International Criminal Court statute include a statute in Article 93, paragraph 10 in the court, where the court can investigate, prosecute, they decide for themselves what kind of cases they will investigate, kind of cases they will prosecute. Also included serious crimes. That's the terminology of this Article 93, Paragraph 10. And I understand very much those of us who will say that serious cyber attack against a country or a part of a country is also today a serious crime and may also today be tried before the International Criminal Court if the member country wishes so. Thank you very much, Stein. Uh, Esther. Okay, I'll try and be really brief. The proposal I made is very easy almost to implement in the U.S. compared to many other countries. I spend a lot of time in Russia and other emerging markets. So I'd like to add two other points. One, you've got to start somewhere. And I'm a US citizen, so I think the US should start. Second, it's quite possible that we will see a period of balkanization of the internet where you can, you can filter, you can slow the flow of countries that don't properly manage their networks, other countries can do it more easily because in many cases the government owns the ISP. The bad news is they can just as easily use it to filter content that they find, quote, dangerous for their government. And I believe we need to be very careful to make sure that people don't use the kinds of things I'm talking about as justification for repression of speech. But I do think it's time to move on dealing with some of the externalities of the mess that we have currently. Thank Thanks, you. Esther. Henning? Well, is uh, cyberspace is regulated or not regulated? Uh, Esther, I appreciate your comments. And indeed, our countries, most of our countries have internet laws. Uh, they have now accepted uh, or they have an equivalent to the Cybercrime Convention. And there is a framework for domestic maneuvering to a large extent. But look at the word at large. Remember what uh, my colleague Jody Westby uh, said this morning or for those who were in the uh, uh, working groups on national security, what they heard. There are huge lacunae. It is not only that uh, the global, the tran global trans transfrontier nature of the in internet um, does not find an equivalent in the legal order in each country. And you can today go to any country, X, uh, where there is no cybercrime legislation and you can, by a station hopping, uh, commit the gravest crimes. And then, especially in the um, national security field, that is a free-for-all. Uh, as we heard this morning, as we 